Well, I mean, it's a, a good point is this. Um, I've been involved in this since the early 90s, and some of the early fire, well, the fire investigators I was initially introduced to, you know, at first, uh, I thought they were fire gods, <laughs> literally. We'd go to some scenes and they would look at things and, and for example, you have a slab foundation with nothing left but two foot of charred debris. Maybe some twisted steel columns. And they would start pointing out fire patterns and how this fire burned and, tr and transitioned from one area to another and I just couldn't see it. And I thank God I had a little bit of common sense and a little bit of knowledge and background to say that just doesn't make sense. If this thing burned for eight hours down to a slab, what really what use are fire patterns? Um, they've been the the original patterns that developed early on in the fire have been overwritten, destroyed. They're gone, most not all the time, but but many times. So over the years, that forced me to start looking and training, uh, setting fires, watching these fires develop. Uh, what happens after the fire transitions from a fire in a room to a room on fire? How does ventilation start playing a role in not only generating fire patterns, but destroying patterns that developed early on in the fire that could help a fire investigator find the area of origin? So I, um, I want to, for the attorneys in the room, um, you've you're dealing with a case, right? A suspected arson case. And Todd, I want to bring you into this conversation now is that, um, could you talk a little bit about, um, all three of you, when, um, as soon as I'm done talking, the <laughs> talk about what the attorney should be doing in terms of vetting a expert, what the qualifications you should be looking for, how, what role will DNA potentially play in a crime scene investigation like this, and what should uh, attorneys or prosecutors be looking for in terms of the DNA angle of, in terms of looking for evidence of intentionally set fire. So maybe Todd, if you could start and then we'll work in the fire experts. Okay, yeah, um, thank you. I won't get into what uh, qualifications you could be looking for in a fire investigator because I have no idea about that. Um, I was a volunteer fireman back in the early 90s and was actually on the arson investigation uh, team at the time, which is kind of funny because all these myths you were talking about, I was trained in. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm in DNA. Um, but you know, there are still some myths out there about what uh, can be done with DNA, uh, what DNA means, what it can do, what it can't do. Um, back in the early days, you know, we were talking about DNA, people said, well, you need a stain the size of a quarter. And then when PCR methods came online, so well, you can, you know, if you can see a stain, we can do DNA on it. And now we're to the point where even if you can't see a stain, we can still do DNA on it. Um, and that, that has a lot of pluses and minuses on it, uh, with it. Uh, we don't know how, and you know, we never have been able to say this, but we don't know how the DNA got there. We don't know when it got there. And so finding DNA, you know, someone's DNA on an object doesn't mean that they touched it right before it was used in uh, whatever activity was done. Um, there's also transfer that can occur. You know, I can shake Mike's hand and then go touch something and transfer his DNA to something. This is a well-studied uh, phenomenon. So that's one of the benefits or one of the downsides of uh, DNA analysis. Uh, one of the benefits of DNA and just thinking with firearms, uh, we get a DNA profile, a usable DNA profile from a firearm about 40% of the time when we analyze one. 15 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to ever get a result from that. Uh, and even 10 years ago when I helped start up the lab at the ATF, we were getting results about 20% of the time, a uh, usable profile about 20% of the time. And this has nothing to do with <clears throat> increased sensitivity. It's more uh, labs are now focusing on the front end aspect of it, better collection methods, where to target, things like that. Um, but we're also finding out that, you know, like a Molotov cocktail case, uh, you find a, you know, someone's DNA on the, the bottle, let's see, because, you know, five times out of ten, the bottle doesn't break. They fill it with gas, they put, you know, a wife beater in it, they throw it against the wall and it bounces. Um, and nothing, the fire just goes out and nothing happens. Uh, we do DNA on that. It doesn't necessarily mean if you find someone's DNA on the mouth of that bottle that it's the person who threw the Molotov cocktail. You know, someone could easily walk down an alley, pick up a bottle out of a trash can, put gas in it, throw it, put a t-shirt in it, throw it, and that happens. Um, and you're getting the DNA of the person who just finished that, you know, that bottle a day before and has nothing to do with the person who made the Molotov cocktail. Um, and the same thing for whatever they're using for the wick. You can find a, an old sock, uh, you know, a t-shirt, whatever material. You could find that uh, in a trash can with the bottle 
make your Molotov cocktail, throw it, and you're going to get someone's DNA off that. That may not have anything to do with the actual crime that's committed. And this is true with any type of touch evidence. You know, we again, we have no idea how the DNA got there. We have no idea when the DNA got there. All we can say is we found this DNA profile on the evidence. It does or does not match, you know, person X, Y, or Z. Um, but one of the, some of the stuff that's still out there is uh, you can't do fingerprints and DNA on the same object of evidence, and that's that's not true. Uh, and actually, there are very few fingerprint techniques that affect DNA analysis. Uh, other than physical developer and a couple other things where they're actually like spraying something or soaking the object in it. If they do super glue, dye stain, uh, whatever method, we can still do DNA on that. Um, we frown on using black powders uh, just because, you know, I used to go to crime scenes, still will uh, occasionally, but you, know, you go to that crime scene with the investigator who's got his lucky black powder brush he's been using for the last 20 years. He just came from a double homicide with blood everywhere. He used that on the entire room. It's picking up flakes of blood. He now goes to a scene uh, where we're looking at, you know, fingerprint on a wall, something like that, and he's using that brush. Well, now you've just taken blood from one scene and transferred it to this scene. So um, we have a rule, basically, if, it's, it, if it was black powdered uh, at a scene or in a laboratory and they didn't use new powder and new brush, we won't do DNA on it. But if you do use uh, a new brush, new powder, then the powder itself doesn't affect the DNA. We're more worried about contamination issues. Um, and same thing for fired brain DNA. If you have a Molotov cocktail, um, glass bottle, device, whatever it is, and you're gonna do fire, uh, fire debris analysis on it, we can still do DNA after they've done uh, the fire, uh, fire debris analysis. You know, they put it in the can, they put it in the oven, they do whatever. It doesn't affect DNA, so we can get DNA after it. Uh, we've gotten results from gasoline-soaked uh, socks or shirts or whatever, so that's not an issue. Uh, we've done several research projects on mal Molotov cocktails, and you know, it all depends on what happens to that evidence. If the Molotov cocktail ends up in the middle of the fire and it burns for five minutes, we're not gonna get DNA on it just because it got fried. A lot of times the, the mouth of the, or the neck of the bottle will bounce away and be protected. Uh, maybe it's just a little charred. You know, we, we'll try it. Unless it's a melted gaba goo, um, we're probably gonna go ahead and swap it for DNA and give it a shot. So extreme heat will degrade the DNA. That will be a problem. It's, yeah, if it's, if it's been exposed to heat for a while, it's, it's probably not gonna uh, work too well. But there could be protected surfaces within that. So, you know, fire happens. Um, there's a big gob of goo, but underneath it's protected. We could still swab the stuff underneath. So, you know, we're gonna look at that. We're gonna make that decision in the laboratory and determine uh, whether or not it's suitable for DNA. Okay, so Mike and, thank you, that Mike and John, um, you, we talked earlier about the two disciplines that are associated with fire investigation. Could you talk about the experts qualifications that you'd be looking for and kind of the trend of the courts um, as to what they're looking at in terms of fire investigators? I wanna just follow up sure. on what, what Todd said. Um, with respect to uh, fire debris analysis, we, we do have an issue uh, in the community about how low can you go? Um, and this is something that uh, the DNA people are struggling with now. How low do you want to go and still be valid? Uh, with respect to fire debris, when I first started in this business, if there wasn't 50 microliters or about a drop of gasoline, kerosene, whatever, in the sample, we weren't going to find it because our methodology was not sensitive enough. Uh, we've now gotten to where we can pick up a 500th of a drop without working up a sweat. And there are people that are, you know, they say, well, why should we stop there? Let's see what we can find. Um, if we go to that extent and try to get even lower than a tenth of a microliter, we'll probably find it. And eventually, every sample that's submitted to the laboratory will be positive and meaningless. So um, this, this is one of the, the issues that, that the fire debris uh, in the laboratory is, uh, is we're not really struggling with it. Most, most people uh, agree that there's a lot of petroleum in our background. Uh, it, we're surrounded by it. And if we look hard enough, we'll find it. So the question is, we're trying to find the, the foreign ignitable liquid residue. Uh, we don't care about the stuff that was, is not foreign to the scene. And so... So, I'll just, so let's follow up on that a little. Is that what are some common household items that might be false positives for accelerants? But it's not really a false positive. Um, it's just that it's there. It's incidental. Okay. Um, bug spray, uh, raid, 
If a can of Raid is in your fire and the bottom blows off of it, it's going to spread mineral spirits all over your fire scene. Uh, shoe polish, furniture polish, um, shoes. Uh, if, if, if your case is based on the arsonist's shoes, you have to look at it very carefully because you can bet that defense is going to give you the peer review that you need uh, on that case. Shoes are loaded with, with hydrocarbons, uh, some of which look a lot like gasoline. And if somebody finds gasoline on one shoe and not the other, that might be helpful. But if they find equal amounts of gasoline on both shoes and they look a little closer, it's really low. It's probably from the glue in the shoe. Um, phone books, newspapers. When you pick up a newspaper and you smell it, that's kerosene you're smelling. That's what they use to clean the press uh, in, between, in, in between days. Um, it's not part of the product. And uh, the person that sold you the newspaper doesn't care that there's kerosene on it, but there's kerosene on it. Phone books. You test a phone book, you're gonna, it's going to test positive for kerosene. Uh, carbonless forms are going to test positive for lamp oil. Um, and, and they're going to test positive for a lot of lamp oil. That's how they work. Good to know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, Mike, did you have something to add to that? Not on the chemistry side. I was going to move into the qualifications. You know, one of the things I've noticed in, in uh, traveling around the United States and into multiple foreign countries when I teach, uh, I, I touched on this a bit, but I, and this will eventually lead into uh, the question or, or the topic of vetting fire investigators today. So I've noticed that I really don't need to be teaching the myths and legends block as much anymore. Especially, um, I've gone to Hungary to teach many years, and uh, the fire investigators there have to have a high de um, college degree in, a, in that topic area or be a fire protection engineer to get into their program. So when I'm teaching them or the younger guys and girls, ladies, about the myths and legends, they're kind of baffled because they never heard them before, and I'm telling them something that to them is, is logically not uh, relevant or just doesn't make any sense. So I've had to start cutting that block of instruction out. So some of the old investigators, they need to hear it because they still, uh, they were taught that way. It's hard to let it go, but it, it's happening. So we are training that out of ourselves in certain areas and not teaching it to the newer investigators. So one of the issues I would suggest you look strongly at in their curriculum vitae or in your questioning of your expert is, you know, do they conduct, attend, participate in current state-of-the-art, state-of-the-science training? Are they attending conferences? Are they keeping up with the latest and greatest, what's coming out of the laboratory testing. At ATF, we have a fire research laboratory that's dedicated to fire research as it relates to criminal investigations. And we have the ability to set up a two-story structure inside our laboratory and, and conduct test burns. You know, are the investigators attending courses and keeping up with the latest state of the science? And and to that, I know we've talked a lot about the difficulty once a fire goes from a fire in a room to a room on fire in finding the area of origin. It becomes much more difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, it depends. In some cases, it may be impossible. In other cases, it's not. And that's where a lot of our latest research has been geared towards at the ATF Fire Research Laboratory, and I've been involved in since 2005, setting fires in, in structures that mimic our everyday uh, bedrooms, hallways, kitchens, living rooms, using newly purchased uh, furniture. When I go overseas or in the United States, we spend a lot of money buying brand new furniture just to burn it. But you have to burn what's out there in order to understand how it burns. So a lot of our, uh, the, I would suggest to you that is well spent taxpayer dollars buying some IKEA furniture just to assemble it and burn it. <laughs> but we do it all the time. And it truly advances our understanding of the science of fire 
and fire development in the compartment. And we are focused on understanding how we can find the area of origin and still find useful patterns post flashover in post flashover compartment fires. Understanding ventilation generated patterns and how we can identify and ferret those out and still identify the patterns that were created by the actual origin of the fire or by the ignition and spread of the fire. So I just want to make sure that uh, all is not lost. It can be done and it's just tougher. In some cases it's impossible, but in many cases it's not. But in order to do it, your fire investigator needs to understand fire dynamics. They need to understand fire behavior in today's world. And it's much different than it was 15, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And then we, go ahead. If, if the last uh, conference your guy attended was the United States Fire Academy in 1995, he hasn't been getting enough training. And the, the resources, because, because of the way we allocate resources in this country, it's not that we're not rich enough to afford it, but our fire departments don't have very good training budgets. And so they can't send people to conferences. Uh, but there is uh, a website called cfitrainer.net that the International Association of Arson, puts, Arson Investigators puts out. Um, it's free. All it takes is the time to go there and, and take the module. And it has all of the modern uh, research on fire investigations there. Your investigator should have several modules of cfitrainer.net on, on his or her resume. And if not, you should ask them why not. Uh, it means they're not keeping up. Uh, it, it's part of the obligation to keep up with, with changes in, in the field. And people that don't keep up, um, it's time for them to retire. Max Planck, the, uh, the great physicist, said the science advances one funeral at a time. Uh, I, when I'm speaking to groups of fire investigators, I, I, I say fire investigation advances one retirement at a time. <laughs> we, have, we have a question over here? Yeah, everything that both of you have talked about is what NFP 921 and 1033 call for. If you look at the BFI, which is the Bureau of Fire, fire Investigation, in the, in the city of New York, you look at their training manual, they don't even reference 921 or 1033, don't even deal with it. They spent probably 20 pages telling you guys how to testify in court and going through the elements of arson as a crime. Uh, while the state of New York, you know, with the Homeland Security, those specifically refer to 921 or 1033 and adopt it. Has there been any kickback or throwback from this um, fire department in New York that they don't want to even recognize the um, 1033? Well, if they put that in their training manual, then their experts are subject to cross-examination on those documents. And maybe they're hoping, uh, and this was, this was the uh, response of the, the fire investigation community as a whole in the early 90s, just ignore NFPA 921, say it's only a guide um, but I, I think the difference between a standard and a guide is, is too precious to be dispositive. If you ask the person, you ask the expert, why did you not follow uh, the standard? And they say, it's not a standard, it's only a guide. Well, your next question is, why didn't you follow the guide? <laughs> you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make any difference, particularly to the person sitting in the jury box. But um, as to why that is, um, in, in uh, the great city of New York, I, I don't know. I suspect uh, if that is the case, and I can't, I can't speak to that, yes. if that is the case, um, it may take a very uh, embarrassing court moment to, ch to, to make that change. Question? Does the standard address the level of certainty regarding the conclusion that this fire was caused by seller or whatever. So there are different levels, of, not levels, but kind of different ways to describe it. There's a statistical number you may be able to apply to it, or a different statistical basis. And then there's the kind of descriptive adjective. You know, I'm sure, I'm not sure, I'm really sure, I'm really, really sure. And, and that, that's where you can really get wrapped around the wheel sometimes. 
So I'm just wondering if that addresses that, that issue. The, the standard has addressed that, and it's got a long history. It had four levels of certainty at the beginning. It had uh, conclusive, probable, possible, um, and, and I don't know. Um, and the legal community immediately jumped on that, and they said, okay, conclusive is what you need for a criminal trial, probable is what you need for a civil trial, and they equated the level of comfort, which is basically what we're talking about here, with the burden of proof. And so they backed off, and, and currently the document says probable and possible. And if it's only possible, you shouldn't be calling the fire based on that. So. But when you get to a word like probable, probable means a lot of different things, but is it 51%, is it 70, does, does it go deeper? There are some forensic sciences where there, there used to be 10 levels of accuracy. Nine. Of, uh, <laughs> well, there's an 11 out there. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm just wondering, is, does the guy define probable in some more quantifiable than that? It, there is a paragraph describing probable, and I think it says more likely than not in, in the document. And that's that. 51% Yeah, pretty much. It, it, it pretty much leaves it up to the investigator to decide his comfort level uh, with, with the call. And so, you know, if he's deviated significantly from various interpretive guidelines that are in there, he's subject to, uh, to cross-examination on that. So that type of standard, you still have to be very cautious even when someone says, you know, it's probable. Okay, let's move forward. This ain't DNA. There's no way uh, to know the ground truth. And so you don't, you can't figure out an error rate for fire investigation. It's just not, it's not possible in, you know, when you're doing a historical recreation of a fire, which is what we're asked to do, it's not possible, uh, except if you have test fires and bring people in, to, to calculate an error rate. Uh, people have tried that, uh, and it turns out that fire investigators aren't so very good at picking the quadrant of origin. Um, there was, there's tests that have been done at uh, ATF training facility in Georgia where they bring people in, and, and stop me if, 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 if I get offensive at any point here. They bring people in to... Uh, I'll correct you, but okay. I won't stop you. All right. <laughs> they, they bring folks in for two weeks of, of intensive training on uh, fire investigation. And one of the first things they do to them is they put them in a, a multi-compartment uh, test fire that they have already burned. And they ask the participants, write down where you think the fire started and what happened. And then they bring them all into a, a room and they show them the videotape of the fire. And the number of people that correctly identified where the fire started was generally south of 10%, although they didn't keep records for obvious reasons. Um, but that, that test was brought outside uh, of the training academy in 2005, and, and Mike was a participant. And they, they just lit a one-bedroom test room, a, one, a, room, a bedroom with one door on fire. And then they asked 53 participants to go in and pick the quadrant of origin. Now, if you close your eyes and spin around and pick one at random, the chances of getting it right are one in four. Three out of 53 got it right. Now, let's say that 23 of those 53 were not qualified to be, to be doing that. Then. Three out of 30 got it right. Still not very impressive. You can't fix the three. Now, that experiment was repeated in 2007 with 70 people. And the results were a little better because they put the fire out earlier. And then they let the fire burn a little longer and the results got not so good. And then if the fire was allowed to burn for three minutes, 25% got it right. So it showed that those guys were as good as random. Um, so so I, I do need to start talking on that topic. <laughs> <Go for it. laughs> okay. So yeah, in the in the mid to late '90s, I was involved in in some of the burns um, at our federal federal law enforcement training center, where we brought in fire investigators for this advanced fire investigation course. Probably back then, it was called advanced arson investigation. 
semantics matter. Um, it's advanced fire investigation. Uh, from that, in 2005, I designed an experiment that John just talked about that we did in Las Vegas. Let's set this up, and it's set up not as a test of fire investigators, but a demonstration. And I've done this same demonstration multiple times since then, um, the one in Oklahoma that John re referenced. Now, I designed the experiment not as a test on fire investigators' abilities, and some, including John, will take that and say, well, that's a result of your experiment. It was set up as a demonstration to um, to wake up fire investigators to this idea of uh, extended post flash over burn times in a compartment generate uh, patterns that are a result of ventilation, not a result of origin related damage, and you need to be aware of it. And so. How the demonstration was designed is, yeah, we burned a compartment before the participants arrived. Uh, we burned it post flashover for several minutes. And then we just asked them to take a couple of minutes, uh, typically less than five. We gave them, I gave them a piece of paper, diagram of the, of the room, four quadrants, and I just said, you know, in groups of two or three due to limited resources and time, step into this room and based on your simple observations, pick what you, where you believe the quadrant of origin is. Now, many of the participants were not fire investigators or were brand new. Some um, were taking the course just because they were interested in fire investigation. So I think that's why John has reduced the numbers from 53 to 30 because um, maybe 30 of them were trained, experienced fire investigators. But here's, here's the big point I want to make is we did not allow them to use the scientific method in examining that structure, in coming to their very um, quick opinion as to the area of origin or the quadrant of origin in that fire, in that compartment. So I think that's the more, in my opinion, the more important part of this demonstration. Number one, we're teaching them about ventilation. Number two, we're teaching them you have to use the scientific method exhaustively. Mike, would you describe the scientific method as you mean it? I can describe it, and actually, there it is. Um, what's, what's most important about that diagram is those arrows, in my opinion. Um, this is an iter iterative process, a repetitive process. You have to do it, you have to come up with multiple hypotheses test those hypotheses over and over against the data you have. Be willing to amend your opinion uh, if there's more data collected, if, if there's conflicting data. So the problem with those demonstrations and taking uh, the data collected from those demonstrations and saying fire investigators get it wrong 90% of the time is the fact that they were not allowed to use the scientific method. We prohibited them from using the scientific method. We wanted everybody to see the same scene. So if you have 50 investigators that need to go through the same scene, we can't allow the first 45 to move anything. We can't allow them to dig. We can't allow them to talk to witnesses. We can't allow them to use the scientific method. So the results were based on a simple two to five minute, look around in here, pick a quadrant, but we're gonna teach you in this course about ventilation generated patterns, how you can overcome some of these issues and actually find patterns that will help you find the area of origin. And most importantly, you better be using the scientific method, especially when you have fire scenes that have transitioned through post flash over full room involvement compartment fires or you're likely going to get it wrong. So, John, do you have some data? Well, what, what you're going to get in the end is a fire investigator saying, look at this picture, look at this pattern, this is the area of origin, and usually they're going to say because it's the lowest and deepest char, or it's the biggest burn pattern in the place. Um, and, and that's what the exercises were designed to train people off of, 
but there's still um, a lot of people that haven't come off of it. You want to um, maybe show some pictures? Do we, do sure. We, are they coming up next? So this is a this is a, a demonstration training fire I did back at Fletzy in, in 2000, and um, recently uh, maybe it was 1999. This is one of these blind tests you might call it. Uh, this is the interior of this test cell, 10 by 12 room, size of a bedroom, set up as a bedroom, and what I have is a, a bag of. Some people in the room probably still recognize what they are. I didn't do a close-up, but it's a bag of VCR tapes. <laughs> some people don't even know what those are. There might have even been some beta tapes in there. <laughs> Sitting in the middle of the room in a plastic garbage bag. And we talked about aluminum thresholds. So in 2000, I'm here in this, well, aluminum thresholds only melt because of ignitable liquids. Why don't we test it? So I put aluminum thresholds in these and set the bag on fire. Let this compartment burn two to three minutes post flashover. Maybe a total of, I don't remember exactly on this one, but maybe a total of eight to 10 minutes this compartment burned. And we start looking at patterns that have developed. And so this is a picture of the aluminum threshold post fire. So that aluminum threshold, you see to the right side of it, it's gone. Now you know, because I showed you, we didn't put any ignitable liquids in there. We didn't pour any gasoline, charcoal lighter fluid, nothing across that threshold. Well, that threshold's melted and gone. That's scientific proof that this can happen without ignitable liquids. And that is the pattern that someone might form an opinion is an ignitable liquid pour pattern because the aluminum threshold melted. That's a, that's a naturally occurring phenomenon in fire because fire, fires reach temperatures of 14 to 1800 degrees all day long, every day, if, even in accidental ignition scenarios. Aluminum melts at 1200 degrees, roughly. It's going to happen. Let's look at another pattern in the same room. So we excavate this room in a layering fashion, remove all the debris, and we see this burn pattern on the floor. That's, to an untrained investigator, that's a classic pour pattern. I mean, that is an ignitable liquid pour pattern all day long. We did not put ignitable liquids in this room. What we did do is we allowed this room to go to flashover and burn post flashover for an extended period of time. That radiant heat from the hot gas layer, fire from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, ventilation from a couple of different openings, that can naturally cause this to occur, and it did in this case. So, you know, there's that potential ignitable liquid pour pattern that you would visually identify if you're not properly trained. Not acceptable anymore. You have to take a sample. If you get a positive from a credible lab that there's ignitable liquid such as gasoline, then you may be able to call that ignitable liquid pour pattern, but you cannot call that a pour pattern based on visual observation alone because this demonstrates uh, it can happen without ignitable liquids. Well, you know, in the old days, this is how we trained fire investigators. You pour ignitable liquid across the cell, watch it burn, put it out, and look at the pattern. And if we put that fire out right now, it's pretty obvious it's going to be ignitable liquid pour pattern. You're probably going to smell the ignitable liquid. If you want to taste it, you're going to taste it. It's going to look something like that. The problem is most fires don't get put out that fast in the real world. They burn post flashover. They burn for an extended period of time. And that pattern gets damaged, destroyed, and disappears often if that fire burns through full room involvement. So that's where the laboratory analysis comes in. I can let you start taking over. This is a fire. It, we'll get into yours shortly. We talk about ventilation generated patterns, V patterns, clean burn patterns. Those are terms you would hear thrown around by fire investigators because they use those patterns in their evaluation analysis attempt to find the area of origin. Clean burn patterns are simply in a very simple generic um, 
definition, it's a pattern that you see on the wall right there on drywall where the combustible material is burned away and it looks like a clean surface. It can happen on concrete block. You burn the, paint, the paint away and you have a clean burn in appearance. It's very generically straightforward. We're human beings and the human eye is attracted to that big clean white area that's in the shape of a V pattern. Um, historically, that V pattern was taught as leading to your area of origin. That's not necessarily the case. It often is, it can mislead you. And as it did in this fire, in this fire I, I set up and burned two weeks ago. Uh, I don't know if you can see on the right side of the picture, it leads down a hallway. Uh, directly in front of the picture is a clean burn above a sofa couch. That's drywall that the paper's burned off of above the couch. Many investigators will step into this room, be drawn to that pattern on the wall, and we now know through training and, and research that that pattern is generated by ventilation after uh, post flashover and extended full room involvement burning. This fire was actually, there, there you can see the hallway better, it's on the right hand side. We actually started this fire down the hall at the end of the hallway. That pattern that looks like an origin pattern if you're not properly trained and, and you don't properly understand ventilation, fluid dynamics, fire dynamics, that pattern there is a misleading pattern. And uh, untrained fire investigators can be drawn to that couch as the area of origin. And then there's a whole host of potential ignition scenarios at that couch that one might consider as the cause of the fire, but what's the problem? That's not They're in the wrong area of origin. Dairy of origin is actually down there at the end of the hall and it's less damaged. Why is it less damaged? Because it didn't get enough ventilation down there. But that's, that's a good thing for us. You know, if, if the fire burns post flashover full room involvement has plenty of ventilation somewhere else and there's not ventilation or oxygen available at the, in, at the area of origin, that in simple terms, that area of origin and those damage patterns are preserved. They are not overwritten. They're still there. We can find those. But you have to be able to, as a fire investigator, identify the ventilation generated patterns, identify the patterns that developed later on in the fire, set those aside, and look for the patterns that um, don't make sense related to ventilation and make more sense related to origin, related to the areas where there wasn't oxygen available. So all is not lost, you can do it, but it's a lot more difficult. So here I think we go into... Well, you... Did you have something to add, Tom? Well, when Mike talks about untrained fire investigators, he means fire investigators who don't understand ventilation. Um, some of these untrained fire investigators have got letters behind their name and 30 years experience or 40 years experience. So. I think to, just to clarify, untrained. Um, Fair. Okay. Fair. <laughs> uh, we're working on it. We're traveling all over the world, putting these demonstrations on. Uh, we're burning structures like this all the time. Uh, we're getting the word out, but it's a, it's a long process. So this is the, uh, the big hairy burn pattern that uh, most of the fire investigators in Las Vegas thought was the origin of the fire. And here's the pattern above the real origin of the fire. It was there. It was there for all to see. It, there's, the pattern survived, and, and frequently they do. The, the trick is teaching fire investigators to recognize that this pattern here can't be explained in terms of ventilation, whereas the other one, directly across from a doorway, can be explained in terms of ventilation. So. This is what we're trying to train fire investigators in now. Go look for the, the patterns that you think are caused by ventilation and ignore them for the time being. It's not the pattern you're looking for. Well, look at the, uh, I just noticed that, the annealing of the springs in the middle of that bed. You know, I, I was involved in setting this fire. We didn't pour any ignitable liquid across that bed. But you have annealed springs in the center of that bed. It's due to heat. Spring. Tensile strength of, of steel, they collapse. It's, it's nothing unusual. I trained a, a young investigator, um, and after a while, he got used to going out with me. 
And I would say to him, Jeff, you see that over there? And he'd say, yeah, John. And I'd say, you know what that means? He said, doesn't mean anything, right? And I'd say, that's right. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of artifacts that are just totally meaningless that are given meaning by fire investigators that they don't deserve. This is a, a typical ventilation pattern. Uh, you get a lot of burning right around the door. So somebody going in there and looking for the, the hottest part of the fire, the lowest and deepest char, would, would call that the origin, and they would be wrong. Uh, this is another pattern. Uh, this is a series of tests set up in, uh, in Denver five years ago. And the chairs were positioned up opposite the doorway in the hopes that the chairs would catch on fire and look like the area of origin. The fire kept moving to the left. And, and I don't think anybody's yet explained why that is, but that's a ventilation pattern from the open doorway. This is a, a V pattern, and it's, uh, it's right here. The fire investigator that went in here said, ah, a V pattern. So the fire must have started at the base of the V, and he eliminated the wire. There was nothing wrong with the wire, so it must have been a set fire. Now, I came in after him, and I said, well, you know, why is the V pattern on the backside of the sheetrock from the next room. If you think about that sequentially, um, first the wall had to come down in order to expose that. There's no way that's the, the plume pattern that the, that the fire started at. But this, this was called arson, and, and at the base of this pattern, the, the floor is burned. And there are no accidental ignition sources there. But with, if that's the origin, and there's no accidental ignition sources, and using this uh, discredited methodology we call negative corpus, uh, this guy said, arson fire. And the homeowner had a long time to wait before the insurance company finally settled with him. But settle they did. Now, there is such a thing as an obvious poor pattern. Somebody tells you they have an obvious poor pattern, that's what it should look like. Um, I got a call from a lady in South Georgia who said, John, my house was hit by lightning and caught fire. And I want you to come and uh, help me because the insurance company said it was intentionally set. And I said, well, you're four hours away. Just as soon as your check clears, I'll be down there. <laughs> she sent me the money. And it took me about 10 seconds in the house. I mean, it still smelled like the charcoal lighter. They had used like a gallon of uh, paint thinner, uh, mineral spirits, to set this thing. It was pretty clear. There is such a thing. And this is, this is the kind of pattern we used to back in the 70s and 80s, and I guess even early in, in Mike's career. We'd show this to fire investigators to teach them to recognize arson. And this is what arson looks like. But once you go to full room involvement, uh, the rules change. And here we have a floor in a, uh, a mobile home uh, with sharp, continuous, irregular lines of demarcation between the burned and unburned areas. Now, the fire investigator gets up on a witness chair and he says, sharp, continuous, irregular lines of demarcation between the burned and unburned areas. And the jury's going, yeah, yeah, that's right. And it looks like somebody spilled a flammable liquid there. But I lit that fire. Not a drop of flammable liquid there. That's the result of alternating exposure and protection. There was a carpet over the floor. It failed sort of randomly, and it shrunk back. And where it shrunk back, it protected the, uh, the area underneath, and it didn't burn, and then the exposed area did burn. But I was there with, with three colleagues who were uh, equally senior in, in fire investigation land, and we all looked at it and said, we've written reports that said that looks like a flammable liquid pour pattern. And in, in terms of how this particular fire burned, we started it in the kitchen. The living room was far more damaged than the kitchen. And had we not known that the kitchen was the origin, we would have all picked the living room as the origin. So I, uh, I want to get to one more topic at the few minutes that we have left. Mike, you said a couple things that kind of raised it in any event in that I think that you were distinguishing between arson and fire investigation is because an arson investigation assumes that it was an arson, essentially. And the, you also talked about, and you showed in your scientific method, you know, new data coming in. And there was also um, a lot of talk about some of the subjectivity involved in pattern analysis. So 
what I want to preface my questions is, is that you know, cognitive bias issues in forensics are an emerging and well-known and, and becoming more and more understood. You know, apart from the Legal Resources Committee, now the OSAC structure has a Human Factors Committee. And human factors are, you know, have been known to influence. Um, ETL Jorah's work has shown that fingerprint examiners, very experienced fingerprint examiners, have changed their opinions based on only contextual information. Anthropologists have been led astray as to the gender of skeletal remains that they were seeing by contextual information. Lots of very objective, relatively objective techniques. So in your view, John, in your view, Mike, um, what role should, um, or how should fire investigators limit the influence of cognitive bias? How much information do you feel like is necessary to conduct their jobs? That's a I'm going to start answering first. John's wrote a couple of papers on that, so I understand his view on that. Uh, we don't live in a perfect world. Fire investigation is a very, very complex uh, endeavor. Uh, as you have seen, fire pattern analysis, once you reach post flashover, is, is a very complex endeavor. So. We have to very uh, vigorously, as fire investigators, apply the scientific method. And what does that entail? That entails, in my opinion, examining all available data, using our expert judgment, training, experience to evaluate that data and come to an opinion. Now, human beings, um, have faulty opinions at times. And uh, you have to support those opinions with the available data. So it, it's a double-edged sword in the fire investigation community and I would say in other um, forensic sciences to try to limit what one might identify as domain irrelevant information. Another investigator might see that as very relevant data that um, they need to evaluate in order to reach a conclusion. So again, it's a double-edged sword. One might call it being biased. Another might say I'm, I'm properly identifying and using the scientific method. And, and who better than the expert himself to evaluate whether or not the information is relevant as to the conclusion or opinion that individual is reaching. If I can't or, or am I, if I'm purposely limited uh, or purposely kept from evaluating all available data, what am I doing? I'm purposely or intentionally violating the scientific method because the scientific method requires us to evaluate all data. So it's dangerous to purposely limit information, in my opinion, uh, for individuals or experts to evaluate. That suggests that it's possible to eliminate bias by an act of will. And the research that Ideal Drawer and others have done has pretty much proved that it's not possible. It would be nice to think that. Um, there are some things a fire investigator, if all he tasked with is determining where the fire started and how, has no need to know. He doesn't need to know that the house was for sale, doesn't need to know that it's been for sale for over a year, doesn't need to know that people are behind on their mortgage, doesn't need to know that the husband and wife had a fight the night before. There are all kinds of contextual biasing clues that it's perfectly good for a jury to hear, it's perfectly good for a lawyer to hear, but the fire investigator, if he's going to get up in front of that jury and say, I scientifically determined the cause and origin or the origin and cause of this fire, um, he should not be influenced by these other uh, factors. Let, it's, it's fine to let a jury hear those factors. But if you're going to get up and be a scientist, you should not be influenced by the fact that the house was for sale. Just figure out what caused the fire. The house for sale, not going to change the burn patterns. The fight. Uh, between a husband and wife the night before. Not going to change the fire patterns, not going to change the arcing, not going to change fire dynamics, not going to change whether there's gasoline on the floor or not. It's like when I'm working on cases where I'm asked strictly to look at the chemistry, where somebody else has said, I'm going to provide consulting on the fire scene, but I don't have the chops to do the chemistry, call Lentini, 
and, and have him review the chemistry. I stop the lawyers. When they start telling me about the fire, I say, look, you want me to tell you whether the lab chemist got it right? And they say, yeah. I say, I don't need to know any of the rest of this stuff. And in fire investigation, it's harder because the fire investigator is typically the prosecution's chief witness or the insurance company's chief witness. Uh, they, they wear too many hats. And the way to do it, if, if the resources are available, and usually they're not, but I've seen it. I was asked to review a case that the national response team, ATF's national response team, did in Reno several years back. And they had one guy that said, tell me what the firemen saw, tell me what the eyewitnesses saw, and let me look at what the physical evidence says. But don't tell me anything else, please, until I'm done. And I got the guy's, uh, I think it was his report. And he said this. And I said, really? And then I got his notes, and, and that's really the way he had done it. He, pr he protected himself from, from the biasing information, and he was so much more credible as a result. And I told the uh, defense counsel that hired me that I couldn't do anything to help him. You know, this looked like they got the right person. But they didn't, he, he refused to let himself be biased by that information. And if that was possible in every case, and I understand it's not, because we got to spend our money on other more important things. Um, if that were possible, that's the way that I would say to do it. The other thing I would say to do is to bifurcate arson cases. And this is one of the recommendations of the Texas Forensic Science Commission following the Willingham fiasco. And that is to hold an evidentiary hearing. Let's look at whether the state can prove that the fire was in fact an intentionally set fire before we start examining issues of who's responsible. Bifurcation, great idea. Never gonna happen, but it's a great idea. I'm just gonna very quickly say, I do not do not disagree. Financial motive, motive-related um, information, we as fire investigators don't need to know that. Uh, other information, um, you know, I went into depth about talking about the cause of the fire. You know, it's the ignition source, the first fuel, and the circumstances that brought them together. We need to know the circumstances pre-fire. Sometimes what, what one investigator considers uh, irrelevant information, in my opinion or other investigators' opinion, is relevant because it gives us information about what happened pre-fire. What was the condition of the interior of that home pre-fire? That's information we need to know and consider in our evaluation of a cause of the fire. So, I mean, it, it's a... It's a tough line to, to walk down, and the best I can say is, is we, as investigators, we need to know bias is an issue. It's an important issue. We need to be aware we can be influenced by biases, and we have to be very diligent in applying the scientific method and testing various hypotheses uh, in, in getting technical and peer review of our work in order to ferret out those potential biases early on. And you as prosecutors and in, in defense attorneys or just attorneys in general handling cases, you gotta be aware of those issues too. And w when you first get that case, look for those red flags and, and try to handle those up front. All right, thank you very much for a really informative panel. With that, very much.